Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here this afternoon. I would like to thank the organizing committee and uh, the board of directors for giving me the opportunity to um, moderate this um, uh, grand round. And as the name uh, implies, uh, these are cases that we are going to discuss. Uh, they are interesting cases uh, presented by very um, uh, uh, astute um, colleagues and discussed by uh, an international expert uh, panel. So it's uh, uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the panel at uh, the beginning. Uh, first, my name is Ali Zahrani. I'm a consultant endocrinologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh. And it's again my pleasure and honor to have a, a panel of experts, uh, Professor Naifa Busaidi and uh, Professor Stephen Wagesback from MD Anderson and Professor Saleh Dasuki from uh, uh, University of Michigan. Uh, I think they were uh, introduced and uh, we all know uh, very well their accomplishment and their expertise in the field and it is a re real uh, pleasure and honor to have them today to discuss uh, uh, and give their uh, expert views on the cases that we will present. I would like also to present uh, uh, our colleagues who have um, uh, generously, uh, generously um, contributed uh, interesting cases. Uh, we have Dr. Mohammed Masoud uh, Alam, uh, who is a board certified consultant physician and endocrinologist, uh, originally from the United Kingdom, uh, but currently working in the United Arab Emirates. Is a member of the Royal College of Physicians and Endocrinology uh, and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. He has more than 10 years experience in endocrinology in the United Kingdom and currently, uh, as I mentioned, in Abu Dhabi uh, Stem Cell Center, uh, which is a leading uh, regenerative medicine center in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and he is going to present a case that we will discuss. We are also pleased to have Dr. Hamad Hussain, who is a staff physician in the endocrinology department of the Medical Subspeciality Institute at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. And prior to that, he uh, uh, was uh, serving as an endocrinologist at Mayo Clinic Health System. Uh, he was an assistant professor at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. Uh, he received his medical degree from Aga uh, Khan University in Karachi, Pakistan, and completed his residency at the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He subsequently completed fellowship in geriatrics at Duke uh, University Hospital in Durham, North Carolina, and endocrinology and metabolism at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. He has experience in endocrinology with special interest in thyroid diseases, and disorders of calcium and osteoporosis. And he is uh, certified in endocrine uh, uh, neck ultrasonography. Uh, he is uh, going to, uh, again, uh, contribute a very interesting case. And finally, uh, we have also Dr. Hassan Shawa from uh, New York. He's an associate professor at Albany Medical Center uh, and Albany Medical College in Albany, New York, uh, USA. He's an associate program director of endocrine fellowship. He did his internal medicine residency, uh, residency at uh, St. Joseph uh, Hospital in Chicago and joined endocrinology uh, fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine and MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. So it's going to be an exciting afternoon with exciting cases. And again, I would like to welcome the uh, uh, presenters and the panel uh, for this um, uh, wonderful activity. We'll start with uh, Dr. Hamad Hussain. Uh, now we have recorded this activity. Generally, I would like this to be live and interactive. However, uh, just to avoid any technical uh, glitches, we uh, recorded the cases. However, if we will discuss those cases and we have some interaction uh, with our panel and our speakers. And uh, if we have time, I'll present also some of my cases in a more interactive uh, way. So without further delay, let's uh, proceed and start with the first case uh, to be presented by Dr. Hamad Hussain. So, um, 
any of you can uh, just tell me if you're seeing the 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 slides of dr hamad hussein yes 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 okay all right so uh, let's listen carefully to Dr. Hussain and his interesting case. Uh, so I have a 35-year-old female who presented to the gynecology clinic with uh, dysmenorrhea. Uh, she had a pelvic ultrasound done that reported a 7-centimeter pedunculated fibroid. Initially, she decided on conservative management with pain medication. Um, a month later, she was noted to have a chronic epidermal cyst in the neck that was removed by plastic surgery. And later on, on chart review, we noticed that the final pathology was read as mature thyroid tissue. She finally decided to undergo fibroid surgery. Um, she had um, a pelvic ultrasound before the surgery that reported multiple uh, bony enhancing bo uh, lesions um, in the vertebral body scattered throughout the bony pelvis, right sacrum, um, femoral uh, head, ischium. Uh, so that came as a surprise to the gynecologist and images were concerning for metastatic bone cancer. So she was completely asymptomatic other than the pain from the fibroids. Um, as to, to evaluate what is the primary, uh, they, she had a pan CT of the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis that reported uh, subcutaneous nodules in the left clavicle or superficial to the left clavicle. There were also um, a small nodule uh, noted in the thyroid about one centimeter. And then heterogeneous densities were noted in the right ischium and the right iliac crest. Uh, subsequently, she had a thyroid ultrasound that reported a left that she did not have her left lobe. Uh, the right lobe confirmed that there was a one centimeter hypoechoic nodule and there were two extra thyroidal masses seen superficial to the clavicle measuring around one centimeter. So this is what the thyroid nodule looks like, hypoechoic. And then uh, this is superficial to the clavicle. There were two nodules almost similar in echogenicity to the thyroid tissue. Uh, she presented at that time to the endocrinology clinic. And that's when she saw me for the first time. She said that she had left hemithyroidectomy in 2013 using a trans axillary approach in Thailand. She was unable to speak for many months after the hemithyroidectomy. And she's, when we checked TSH in the clinic, it was normal. She was not on levothyroxine. There was no family history of thyroid cancer. And after the thyroid surgery in 2013, she did not have any subsequent follow-ups in Thailand. Uh, we did a biopsy as the next step for uh, the thyroid nodule and the nodule in the uh, superficial to the uh, left uh, clavicle. And both reported uh, benign follicular nod uh, thyroid. Okay, so Naifa, are you with us? Yes. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, this is a young uh, woman who presented to the gynecologist with some uh, gynecological complaint. She was found to have uterine fibroid and was planning surgery. During that time, she was found to have multiple uh, skeletal lesions. And in her history, she, she had some thyroid surgery in the past, uh, presumably for a benign disease. And actually this was further confirmed with the FNA biopsy that was done in July, 2021, showing that um, her disease is benign. That is the category two. So the question for you, do you think the bone lesion uh, are um, related in any way to the thyroid or these are coming from the uterus? And whether that fibroid, uh, uterine fibroid was misdiagnosed as fibroid when it is really uh, cancer. Yeah, so um, great questions and great case. It's not an uncommon um, scenario where you get these confusing multiple lesions. Um, and so in this case, you know, I always tell my patients that pathology review is key, right? Getting that tissue, um, because it's an unusual case, right? You have tissue from the thyroid, tissue outside of, the, supposedly outside of the thyroid, that is all being called benign and you have to wonder and the previous surgery um, that she had had in, in Thailand. So ideally we would get all that tissue. I usually have the patients bring it so that we have our pathology review it and evaluate whether there is um, any room for, you know, to, to say that there is a malignancy within that thyroid. Um, you know, if we said it, when the pathologist on that FNA, if that follicular uh, nodule or nodule with follicular tissue is in a lymph node, um, then we always question, right? Benign follicular thyroid tissue within a lymph node is presumed to be cancer. I mean, sure, embryologically, it could have come down in a strange way, but you know, you have to be suspicious. 
So other things that you can do, you can measure um, the thyroglobulin, you get proper imaging at this point and have that pathology review to start with before you make any conclusions as to what's going on. Right. Wonderful. Let me see what Stephen thinks and whether um, he thinks that the two pathologies uh, uh, in the uterus and thyroid are related in any way. Yeah, good morning. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. <clears throat> yeah, not much to add to, to NIFA, but just, just one thing that comes through my mind, and I'm sorry, I'm a little confused on the history, but, you know, this, this patient had a, a previous uh, lobectomy, uh, apparently for benign disease. But when we see patients in, in this setting, one thing that comes to mind is, is was it perhaps a missed, um, you know, carcinoma? And that's why I agree with NIFA, that pathology review, if you can get it um, from the original surgery, you know, is, is very important because, you know, every so often we'll see patients like this with a remote history of lobectomy who presents with metastatic thyroid cancer in the bones. Now, in terms yeah, of the... The pelvic uh, findings, so, you know, assuming this is, um, you know, a, a uterine-based mass, I was a little, I, I think I missed uh, whether this was an adnexal uh, issue or a uterine issues, but a, another thing to... It's to uterine about, issue. It is uterine, okay. So I would suspect probably unrelated, but not being an expert in uterine cancer, I don't quite know the, the metastatic pattern of that disease. Um, and then I find these little nodules in the neck interesting. And so I just wonder, it, you know, after a transaxillary approach, is, is this something that could happen, like some, some seeding of normal thyroid tissue? But the thing is, uh, Stephen, is that uh, biopsy now is clearly benign, as you can see from both uh, the, the extrathyroidal and, uh, and the thyroid nodules. Yeah. So... Yeah, I just I just didn't know with the transaxillary approach, like how how could that thyroid normal thyroid tissue be in that location? That's just a little um, too lateral, I think, for ecto normal ectopic thyroid. But it's 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 an interesting thing. So I guess in this setting, I Lee, I would I would be thinking that the, there was a cancer in the previous lobectomy specimen. Okay, let's proceed and see. Uh, I'll get back to you, Saleh, later on with another question. <laughs> Subsequently, to find out where is what is the primary, she had had a bone biopsy done. So the bone biopsy reported a colloid-rich uh, follicular tumor infiltrate, um, and they were positive. The cells were positive for Pax8, uh, thyroglobulin, CK19, and um, thyroid transcription factor one. Uh, the findings were consistent with the uh, metastatic follicular thyroid cancer. Her thyroglobulin uh, was elevated at 318, 398 with a thyroglobulin antibody level of 13. Uh, these are some uh, uh, cytology slides uh, uh, from, or pathology slides from uh, the, the, bo uh, the bone, and this is from the supraclavicular uh, nodule, and they both report um, uh, thyroid, bland thyroid follicles um, with the with the or follic thyroid follicles with bland nuclei and filled with colloid, they're all consistent with uh, presence of metastatic thyroid uh, tissue in these um, in these areas. So subsequently, she had a PET scan uh, done to figure out where uh, if these uh, bony uh, lesions were PET uh, FDG avid, and also if she had any other uh, lesions in the body to suspect metastases. Um, surprisingly, no FDG avid foci were noted to suspect metastatic involvement in the axial or appendicular skeleton. So uh, Saleh, uh, how would you manage this patient? Now the diagnosis I think is clear. Uh, this patient has metastatic follicular thyroid cancer. She had lobectomy in the past. And um, um, here we are. What do you think we should do next? We don't hear you, Saleh. Are you with us? Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I was saying that, uh, uh, you know, um, this is an area that um, uh, obviously my colleagues, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, are much more experienced in that. Obviously, this is not a straightforward case. Uh, certainly, uh, now uh, that we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it sounds like a malignant thyroid uh, disease. Uh, the first thing is total thyroidectomy and uh, uh, confirming, I mean, completion thyroidectomy, completing and then uh, uh, looking at the, uh, um, uh, you know, the... Uh, 
And as Naifa mentioned and the other colleague, reviewing all the previous uh, pathological samples, um, and obviously this is a metastatic uh, disease. If it turns out to be that way, uh, what kind of uh, thyroid cancer, obviously, uh, um, it, from what I could see from the slides, it, it doesn't look exactly papillary, at least from what I could gather from the screen. Um, so one would think uh, maybe follicular, which, you know, obviously is more aggressive than papillary in some ways. Uh, the other thing, uh, so I, I think, and then after that, I think this is a systemic disease where uh, I would, uh, you know, um, usually these cases, I, um, uh, at our institution and our setup, uh, we refer to uh, our oncologist uh, uh, colleagues, and certainly some cases to NIFA and her colleagues at MD Anderson uh, for systemic uh, uh, management, I believe. Um, and I have another comment, um, uh, uh, but uh, that would be my answer to your question. Okay, thank you, Saleh. Uh, Naifa, uh, you would agree with completion thyroidectomy and the radioactive iodine afterwards? So I have more questions than I have answers. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so I would, you know, I, I think there's still some pieces missing, right? But just to, to make the point and emphasize what both my colleagues have said, so follicular thyroid cancer is one of those things that on tissue sometimes can be confused and look like normal, right? Because it's just so well differentiated, it can look like normal thyroid tissue, right? So, um, but this, you know, occasionally happens when you see um, somebody calls it benign and then you have these metastatic disease. So again, we definitely need pathologic review. Um, the other uh, point that Dr. Wagaspak was mentioning why he asked, you know, just for, for to share things with the audience, why he asked if it's an adnexal mass is some of the things that were running through all of our minds was, is this a Struma varii case, right? When you start with, you know, GYN and then it ends up with thyroid, but this was not an adnexal mass. So it wasn't from the ovary and it was in the uterus. So I, we still have this question of what's going on in the uterus, but people can have multiple things. So I think we need a multidisciplinary approach. We need to um, uh, get um, gynecology involved, get pathology review and get um, proper imaging. I mean, the PET didn't show anything, but um, get good cross-sectional neck imaging as well is important. And the thyroglobulin is helpful um, that it's elevated, um, but we need proper imaging again because uh, to evaluate the extent of disease. But yes, if you have metastatic disease, typically the treatment is to go and do an open, you know, thyroidectomy um, and uh, remove what you can followed by radioactive iodine. So yes, to answer your question. Fantastic. Stephen, any uh, further comments? Yeah, just, just a couple of uh, further thoughts to add to my colleagues. Um, so first, in a case like this, you know, I, I understand she was asymptomatic, but, you know, in, a, in, in someone like this presenting with metastatic follicular carcinoma with bone metastases, if they're symptomatic, usually the sequence of events would be to radiate the bone metastasis uh, before going to completion thyroidectomy. Um, uh, another point would be that um, the lack of FDG uptake would predict that this is going to be an iodine avid uh, tumor, but I think we have to be upfront with our patients right away that this is not going to be a curable tumor, um, that we can probably treat it with radioactive iodine, but it's not going to cure it. Um, the, my third point is, I still think there's something weird with that subcutaneous nodule, because as, as we know, follicular carcinoma really is less likely to go to, to spread local regionally unless it's more poorly differentiated or herpal cell. So, so it makes me wonder if it's somehow related to this transaxillary approach uh, to surgery that, that just kind of seeded along some soft tissues there. And then the last thing um, would be that in cases like this, I mean, you could certainly consider um, molecular testing on, on the tumor, on the biopsy if you, if you can. But unfortunately, in this case, you're probably not likely to find an actionable mutation or fusion. All right. Uh, I think all of these points are excellent. Uh, Dr. Hamad, are you with us? Do you want to say something before we proceed with your presentation? Annie, I know your presentation will disclose the whole thing and uh, will review the subject. But uh, if you have any comment at this time, we'll uh, be happy to hear you. Sure. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon. I'm here. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, so uh, just to add a few points. Uh, so she did have the hemithyroidectomy in Thailand in 2013, like I mentioned, and was it through a trans axillary approach. She was told at that time that the pathology was benign. And we did try to get those pathology slides from Thailand, but unfortunately we were not successful. Um, and um, after that, like I said, she did not have any follow-up for a few years until she presented to her gynecologist. So the gynecologist is the one who referred her here. Um, but, and the MRI uh, findings were very consistent that this was a uterine fibroid. It did look like that. Uh, she not, did not have any adnexial uh, masses on um, imaging. Um, yeah, so that's what I have to add so far. But I, I think as we disclose the case, I have, I'll have a few more things to add. And, sure. and those the cutaneous nodules here. So we did, uh, she did have uh, those nodules on the left side, and that was where the trans axillary approach was taken uh, when she had the initial surgery done in, in Thailand. Fantastic. Okay, let's proceed with the case so we can go to the next case. So in September 2021, uh, we decided that she should undergo completion of uh, thyroidectomy. So she had right thyroid lobectomy, uh, central neck dissection at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, three nodular masses were encountered in the subdermal region that, uh, and in the sternomastoid uh, muscle that appeared to be remnants of the left thyroid lobe uh, from the time that she had robotic excision, and these were uh, taken out as well. Final pathology reported left sub, uh, clavicular mass excision. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, subclavicular uh, mass uh, was consistent with metastatic follicular thyroid cancer, uh, whereas the the right thyroid lobectomy was uh, negative for um, any malignancy. So. Um, the next step was to do uh, to figure out if these uh, lesions were um, um, uh, radioactive iodine avid. So she underwent a thyrogen stimulated whole body scan uh, that showed uh, multiple foci of increased um, uh, tracer activity in the bilateral thyroid beds in the supraclavicular region and multiple areas in the bony skeleton. And uh, this is what the uh, thyrogen stimulated radioactive iodine uh, scan uh, looked like. So our treatment plan after this was that we were for the bone lesions, uh, she was gonna receive enters after treatment. Uh, we decided to give her high dose radioactive iodine ablation uh, for the uh, follicular thyroid cancer metastases. Uh, she decided to continue treatment outside of Cleveland Clinic. She went to Dubai uh, to discuss radioactive iodine treatment and eventually went to Thailand, uh, back to her home country for continuation of um, um, thyroid cancer treatment. So, so uh, uh, I think Dr. Hamas is going to review this. I think the case now is uh, is clearly a missed uh, follicular thyroid cancer diagnosis uh, years ago and uh, seeding uh, of the thyroid cancer cells into the track of the robotic surgery um, uh, uh, canal or, or uh, a track. And, um, and this is follicular thyroid cancer that was... Uh, missed on uh, FNA, which is understandable. I think FNA is, uh, we all know that FNA is not, uh, 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 is not good for follicular thyroid cancer. Uh, so uh, any final comments before we um, hear a little bit of literature review on this from Dr. Hamad? Dr. Wagaspak called it. That was his first question. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, that's correct. All right, uh, so let's move so we can get to the second and third case. All right. Uh, one of the first cases that I saw uh, for which uh, in which I saw there, there was tumor seeding during robotic assisted uh, robotic assisted thyroid, trans axillary thyroidectomy. Uh, there was uh, in, looking at the literature. I, I read that the uh, seeding of thyroid tissue can occur at trocar sites. Uh, traumatic handling of tumor and inadequate surgical skills are suspected essential uh, factors for post uh, for the port site seeding. There were some case reports that I came across. Uh, the, the first one from uh, the earlier one was from 2006. Where the patient with surgical tract and cervical nodal recurrence uh, and distant metastases uh, following a two stage robotic assisted.
acid surgery uh, was noted. And uh, she did actually undergo radioactive iodine treatment for VTC that was initially regarded as a single intermediate uh, indeterminate nodule. Uh, there was another case in 2020, January, after robotic assisted uh, trans axillary thyrotectomy for an initially what was noted to be a Bethesda 4 nodule with no ex uh, with, uh, which was later confirmed to be encapsulated FTC after uh, robotic surgery, no extrathyroidal extension and the patient did undergo RAI. Later, um, a few years later, she was noted to have elevated thyroglobulin that showed cervical recurrence and um, intraoperatively three carcinomatous nodules were removed and they were noted to invade uh, the right sternohyoid. Uh, two years later, again, there was elevation of thyroglobulin and another site in the prepectoral uh, uh, area was noted and the subcutaneous nodule was noted in the prepectoral area. That was removed and again proven to be thyroid cancer. Um, and there are other reports uh, more recently of benign tract seeding as well after robotic uh, assisted uh, thyroid transaxillary thyroid surgery in a young woman who underwent robot assisted lobectomy for thyroid nodules and three years later she was presented with subcutaneous nodules along the surgical track and uh, this was considered to, to represent seeding of benign thyroid tissue so uh, i'll just quickly go over this because most of us know this as follicular thyroid cancer is the second most kind of common differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, histological definitions of PTC and FTC were based on predominantly on papillary or follicular growth. But in the 70s, um, uh, Kem and Rosa described follicular variant of PTC, concluding that alterations in nuclear morphology were the most important diagnostic criteria for classification of car carcinoma as papillary thyroid cancer, regardless of the dominance of uh, follicular pattern. Um, the SEER database shows us that FTC presents a little bit later as compared to PTC at age 49 years on an average, spreads hematogenously, and distant metastasis mostly occurs to the bone and the lung. Uh, ultrasonographic features a little bit uh, on the borderline between follicular adenomas and follicular carcinomas. This is uh, just uh, some cases my own uh, from my own practice. Uh, you can see in the first case, there's some suspicious features, microcalcifications. In the second one, there's interrupted rim calcifications. Here, there is uh, interrupted uh, or irregular halo around the nodule. But th this one looks uh, very close to a spongiform nodule, but still the final pathology was consistent with uh, FTC. Um, so these are the techniques that we have for remote access thyroid surgery. So there's endoscopic breast approach, uh, bilateral axillary breast, breast approach. Uh, there is a just plain axillary approach, face lift, lift approach, uh, where there's an incision uh, made um, adjacent to the, pro, post, uh, the uh, pre auricular or post auricular space. And then there's trans oral approach, uh, endoscopic approach. A um, good candidate for surgery would be a is considered to be a pain patient, uh, excess of, uh, absence of excess body fat. Uh, well circumscribed nodules are more um, uh, favorable for this kind of uh, procedure. Thyroid lobe has to be measured less than five to six centimeter. Uh, underlying thyroid pathology with no evidence of thyroiditis on ultrasound should be present. Um, and then uh, there's absolute contraindications, for example, Graves' disease, uh, evidence of thyroid cancer, substernal extension, previous neck surgery. So these are guidelines from 2016 uh, ATA. Um, so um, uh, recently, the indications for uh, uh, robotic assistant surgery have expand, been expanded to well differentiated low risk thyroid cancer among some surgical groups. Um, and risk of complications is similar between cervical approach and trans uh, axillary approach, as you can see on this slide, uh, with transient hypocalcemia occurring in 37, permanent in 1%, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, uh, and seromas, hematomas. And finally, the last couple of slides I will go over uh, this uh, the biggest study from uh, Louisiana, where they compared trans axillary to uh, cervical approach. Uh, so those patients uh, who were uh, chosen for trans axillary approach are uh, younger uh, patients uh, or thinner patients. And um, uh, this one uh, uh, important slide would be uh, that the overall, um, the, uh, in the robotic surgery, the, the time of op surgery was slightly longer and the length of stay uh, for uh, this robotic surgery procedure is slightly uh, lower. So, and the risk of complications, like I said before, for both in this group, for both cervical and robotic approaches have been considered, uh, have been, was noted to be similar. So in conclusion, I discussed the uh, atypical presentation of one, one of my patients with follicular thyroid cancer reviewed the diagnostic challenges we uh, encounter on a daily basis for, for follicular thyroid cancer patients and discussed the potential complications of trans uh, thyroid surgeries. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you, the scientific committee. My name is Dr. Hamad Hussain. I'm from. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussain. Uh, Hamad Hussain. Uh, uh, any final comments uh, on this case before we move to the next case? Yeah, if I may. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah great case. Thank you. Um, and thanks for um, for the this nice discussion. Just one last thing, and uh, and I think. Uh, uh, Naif and I may have discussed these over the years. That look, if, if you if you look at the uh, the uh, the legion that we saw in ultrasounds, just it's, it's a sub centimeter uh, legion in the thyroid. <laughs> and uh, uh, if I if I got the case correctly, uh, I'm not sure about the uh, the, the lobectomy that one. I forgot the details, but uh, this uh, on the recent one is just a very small legion, right, Naif? I th I think this patient, if I may, uh, I think this patient had follicular thyroid cancer in 2013. Okay. Uh, FNA is obviously does not diagnose follicular thyroid cancer. So I, I think if she had FNA in Thailand, it must have been interpreted as as benign or maybe Bethesda two or three. And uh, and I think she uh, she continued to have a uh, disease since then, and she had metastasis. This is what I think. I don't know what, what Knife and Stephen thinks. Uh, if I can interrupt here, yeah, that's what we think as well. That the initial surgery in 2013, maybe the pathology was misread. Uh, that's when the initial cancer was, and since then she may have had uh, hematogenous spread. Um, and then she presented to us about six or seven years later. The, the other side that was taken out by in our institution, the right lobectomy that she had, that did not show any malignancy uh, in that uh, lobe. And then the other uh, areas where the, uh, the cancer had seeded, uh, those were the, they, they pretty much uh, fell into the pattern of um, surgical tract seeding. So she had, uh, just before she presented to us, she was actually seen by plastic surgery, like I mentioned in the case. And they did remove a subcutaneous nodule and it was mature thyroid tissue or red as mature thyroid tissue. But then she had did not, I don't know if anyone paid attention to that because she didn't have any follow-ups for that. And then she was noted to have those subcutaneous nodules super clavicularly, and then she had those bone metastases. So I think uh, you're right that uh, the initial surgery in 2013 may have been misread as uh, uh, that was the original cancer that she had. And uh, one other point that was ra raised was if she should go uh, external beam radiation, I think, uh, but we did actually, she was reviewed by our uh, radiation oncologist as well. Because she was asymptomatic and because the bony lesions were not in an area where she may have experienced a fracture, where she could experience a fracture in the future. That's why we didn't, uh, the nuclear, uh, the, uh, the radiation oncologist did not think at this point uh, she needs any uh, external beam radiation. So that's why she went directly for the radioactive iodine treatment. Let's move to the next case because we have still two cases. So um, let's go to the next one. And um, all right. So here is another case, this time from uh, New York. I don't know if you see my screen. Do you see the, the, the title of the, of the case? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, I am uh, Dr. Hassan Shawa. I am one of the endocrinologists at Albany Medical Center uh, in New York, uh, USA. I'd like to present a case, uh, interesting case of thyroid cancer. Um, the title of it is thyroid cancer metastasis or not. That is the question. So my patient is 66 year old woman, uh, was found to have thyroid nodules on routine exam in March, 2016. That was almost six years ago. Uh, this was further evaluated by a thyroid ultrasound that showed three nodules, a nodule in each lobe, right lobe, left lobe, and isthmus. Uh, she had biopsy of all of those nodules. They were benign except the one in the left that I'm showing here, and that's the original ultrasound. Uh, this came back consistent with papillary thyroid cancer. Um, as you can see, the nodule is suspicious, being hypoechoic, irregular borders with some uh, calcifications. This is the sagittal view, sorry, probably it's not that very clear. June 2016, patient underwent total thyroidectomy. Intraoperatively, the left lobe mass had infiltration into the overlaying left sternothyroid muscle which was taken in block with, with the thyroid. Pathology confirmed papillary thyroid carcinoma with tall cell features. 
the dominant foci was 2.1 centimeter in the left lobe with extra thyroidal extension into the skeletal muscle. The margins were involved. Another microscopic foci measuring only three millimeter in the right lobe was identified. One lymph node was taken out and that was not involved with malignancy and there was no lymphovascular invasion. August 2016, uh, so that's two months after the surgery, she underwent iodine ablation. She received 100 millicurie of I131. Post-treatment scan revealed two, two foci of uptake in the thyroid bed, likely representing a thyroid remnant. TSH was uh, 116 with thyroid globin of 1.8 and undetectable thyroid globin antibody. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have those images uh, to share because it was done outside our center. Uh, March 2017, so that's almost seven months after iodine treatment, TSH was suppressed as you'd like to do in thyroid cancer patient. Thyroid globin low, but not uh, undetectable. Thyroid globin antibody undetectable. Then, uh, May 2017, almost a year after the surgery, nine months after the iodine treatment, ultrasound showed the thyroid bed to be unremarkable, but there were three lymph nodes. They were um, plumped in terms of the uh, size, but uh, prominent in terms of the size, but not necessarily very suspicious looking based on how they look. So this is uh, a lymph node in right zone three measuring 2.2 centimeter times 0, 0 0.5. Uh, so it's kind of flat looking, round, maybe some fat hilum, fatty hilum there. Uh, another smaller lymph node in the left zone one, uh, maybe slightly rounded, but, but it's under one centimeter in size and zone one is not uh, a usual uh, location for thyroid cancer metastasis and left zone three and remember our thyroid cancer case was mostly the dominant law it was the dominant foci was in the left lobe so this left zone three again flat looking lymph node not clear fatty hyaluron though <coughs> measuring 1.6 times 0.4 centimeter Let's uh, let's stop here and, uh, and discuss a little bit. Uh, th this scenario is not uncommon in our practice. This is a patient who, ca uh, who came with um, mild intermediate risk papillary thyroid cancer, tall cell variant, 2.1 centimeter, but there was some uh, local invasion to the skeletal muscles. Um, now she had total thyroidectomy, she had radioactive iodine, and now uh, on follow-up her uh, TG continued to be detectable, although in the what is called the indeterminate range, she has some findings on the ultrasound uh, that are around one centimeter or less. Uh, the question here for uh, uh, Stephen, uh, would you biopsy these lymph nodes for these uh, ultrasound uh, findings? Yes, thank you, Ali and, and Hassan. It's so great to see you. Um, so, you know, I, some thoughts is obviously this was a, you know, a more locally advanced tumor, a T3B invading skeletal muscle. And interestingly, only one um, lymph node was removed at the time of her original surgery, probably I'm guessing a perithyroidal lymph node. So the first suspicion would be she likely is, is most likely to have central neck disease, given that she likely has a um, BRAF mutated tumor, given the tall cell variant. The fact that radioactive iodine is unlikely to uh, uh, you know, destroy any residual cancer. So in terms of this, I don't know, I'd have to look at it more, I guess, and uh, trust uh, the instinct of our ultrasonographers, uh, whether or not they, they, it be believes it's warrants biopsy. I think we probably would biopsy this given the size. Um, in the location. I know, Naifa, you will not, uh, you will not say something different from uh, Stephen, but I will ask you would, you, would you biopsy this? Yes, I just say ditto to what Stephen said. No, um, so, you know, so I'm in agreement. The first things that were going through my mind too were like, how do you have a 2.1 sonometer with extrathyroidal extension, but no lymph nodes? So it's very common, unfortunately, that 
um, you know, this is why the guideline, the, the last set, set iteration of the ATA guidelines made a big deal about preoperative imaging, right? Let's look thoroughly at the entire neck because, you know, you don't want to just remove the thyroid and whatever lymph nodes you see, but try and get a good idea of the lateral neck and the central neck. Um, so I'm highly suspicious, like Stephen is, that there are positive um, nodes still in the neck, whether these are them or not. Um, I want to ensure that we did not just a thyroid beta um, uh, ultrasound, but we did an entire neck ultrasound. Um, so uh, nothing else to add. The tall cell variant makes everything suspicious. And just because the thyroglobin is low and the radioactive iodine scan didn't pick something up doesn't necessarily mean we don't have a high suspicion that there's still disease there. Sure. Saleh has a big uh, ultrasound practice in Michigan, and I'm sure he will biopsy this. Would you, Saleh? We don't hear you. Unmute yourself, please. Yeah, definitely. Ditto to both of my colleagues. Certainly, this is uh, quite, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's more aggressive than average. I think I would, uh, I would go with this uh, more superficial uh, one on the right side uh, because that's, to me, I think this is accessible. The one in the zone one uh, here is, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I haven't done a lot of uh, zone one biopsies before. Uh, I, I've done, you know, uh, the, um, the, the lateral. Um, this one looks like deep and I'm not sure how accessible maybe, but I, definitely I would choose uh, at least the right one to biopsy. Okay, let's see what Dr. Hassan did. Uh, so let's so continue. We watched the patient September 2017, a few months later, TSH undetectable, but thyroglobin now is up from 0 0.4 uh, to 0 0.76, and gain TG antibody is still undetectable. She had a, ye a year and three months after the iodine treatment, the diagnostic th um, thyrogen induced whole body scan that was basically negative with neck uptake estimated to be almost undetectable, 0.04%. The thyroglobin stimulated with the thyrogen was up to 5.9 uh, with negative TEG antibody. So we got a patient with indeterminate response, um, the uh, unstimulated TEG is below one, and the simulated uh, TG is between one and 10. And those are the images of the uh, diagnostic whole body scan, basically uh, no uptake, uh, except for some physiologic uptake in the salivary glands and the stomach. December 2017, TSH undetectable, TG is stable at 0.78. Uh, neck ultrasound again showed those lymph nodes that I showed before. The right zone three grew slightly because the TG did not go any lower after the iodine treatment. In fact, it went slightly higher. Uh, that's why I decided to do FNA sample the right zone three and left zone three lymph nodes, and both were benign and TG washout was negative. So we continued active surveillance. Every six months, I used to see the patient. Uh, do to do labs and once a year ultrasound. So the TG remained stable at the beginning and uh, ultrasound showed stable findings. September 2019, she missed her appointment and she came in March 2020. This is the first time the TG would go up, up above one. However, at that time, the TSH was not suppressed. So I attributed that probably because the TSH is not very, fully suppressed. Next, Ultrasound did not show any uh, different find. Let's uh, uh, review this case one more time at this time. Now, uh, FNA was done and it's negative. And uh, on follow-up, her TG remained stable but slowly increasing. Uh, should we just keep watching this patient? I mean, we have done uh, the, the, the basics. We have done the FNA. We, we have followed this patient. Uh, should we entertain any other uh, diagnostic test, uh, uh, Stephen? Yes. Um, so, you know, this is a patient with, you know, what appears to be a higher risk tumor with residual, you know, persistent biochemical disease at least. And so, so at this stage, you know, I would be entertaining offering a contrast enhanced CT neck chest um, as a start, um, you know, still her central neck is the highest risk area, I think, for, for disease. 
And, um, you know, at least a couple of times in the past, I've been fooled by missed things on ultrasound that CT reveals in the central neck, particularly upper mediastinum or even frank tracheal invasion. Um, so I, I think I would think of that first. And then, you know, a, another option could be consider an FDG PET CT. Um, but I, I might start with, with just regular CT. Any, any strong opposition to this from Naif or Saleh? Not strong opposition, but I do want to point out this is, you know, where it gets confusing, right? Um, because we, we know, we understand everything. Um, sorry, did I get cut off? Oh, no, no, we, we hear it. Sorry, we, um, everything, you know, I agree with everything that Dr. Wagaspak said, but I want to point out if we went strictly by the guidelines, right? The thyroglobulin is low. Um, the, you know, it doesn't meet quite meet the, the, you know, in, in the United States, we have to go by what insurance pays for, unfortunately as well. So it doesn't quite go by, you know, the, the CM, the, the cutoff for an elevated thyroglobulin to get a PET scan. So you might get some pushback. Um, and you know, with this thyroglobulin, you probably still suspect that it's in the neck. I personally would do exactly what Dr. Wagaspak said. I would get imaging of the neck and chest because we've all been burnt. We know this is a high risk tumor, but if you strictly went by guidelines, you're not necessarily having to do anything further. So if somebody told me I was just going to watch this and continue follow-up, it's not the wrong thing to do. I just wanted to point that out, but I, I would do advanced imaging because of that. Very good. Uh, I, I think the only thing, uh, and I, I totally agree, uh, but I think now we are seeing uh, a significant increase in the TG. Uh, Technically speaking, she is now having biochemically incomplete response. And I think it's fair to look farther beyond the neck or, or, or deep in the neck with uh, cross-sectional imaging. So let's, uh, Dr. Hassan, are you with us? Uh, do, you have, do you want to comment at this time? Uh, on? Yes, I am here. Good morning and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, special greeting uh, for Dr. Waxback and Dr. Pusaidi, uh, my former attendings, my former faculties 10 years ago when I did my training at MD Anderson. Um, thank you, Dr. Ali, for choosing my case for presentation. Uh, the few comments that uh, I want to add, um, the in, indeed central neck dissection was not done originally. It was prethyroidal uh, lymph node uh, that was not involved with malignancy. Uh, the other thing, it was tall cell features, not tall cell variant. Uh, so in our institution, if the tall cell uh, 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 percentage is below 30%, we call it features, but above 30%, we call it tall cell variant. Um, uh, also the last two ultrasounds uh, that I put here in 2019 and 20. Uh, 18, they were all my own ultrasound. So normally I do my own ultrasound because uh, sometimes the technician, uh, they don't necessarily do a thorough good, good job uh, in looking and scanning the whole neck. So I, I, I always keep a, a good attention to the central area because I know that's the most common uh, location for thyroid ca cancer metastasis and this patient did not have central neck dissection, but never seen really any lesion. Uh, in the central neck uh, compartments bilaterally. Okay, let's let's proceed and see what uh, what will happen. So, Thanks. then in September 2020, she missed her appointment because the because of COVID uh, concerns. It was the beginning of the pandemic, and March uh, 2021, TG was again uh, elevated above one. Uh, with suppressed TSH, neck ultrasound stable findings. That's why we decided to do CT scan with, uh, of the neck and chest. The neck was unremarkable, but the CT scan chest showed 4.1 centimeter uh, mass, subsolid mass in the left apex uh, with a solid component measuring 1.1 centimeter. There were small uh, ground glass nodules also were seen throughout the two, uh, the, uh, both lungs. Uh, three of them, seven millimeter, four millimeter, and five millimeter, and those are the images of the subsolid mass. This is the solid component here, and this is a, a subcentimetric ground glass nodule here, another one here, and the third one is there. Okay, let's again uh, comment on this. Isn't this surprising? Uh, 
uh, Naifa? Definitely. This is this is suspicious, or as my kids say, this is sus. So what do I mean by that? So yes, you do have a patient who had tall cell features, um, you know, depending on the pathology, what they want to call it. So you were at intermediate risk um, to high risk, and you suspected that there's other disease. So you get a CT chest, but I want to point out a couple of things. When you see ground glass nodules in general, those are not thyroid cancer, right, in general. Now, when you have a big mass like that in the left apex, um, you know, I would love to see more images of that, but this would definitely warrant a biopsy. Do not assume that, in my opinion, I don't think that we should assume that this is thyroid cancer. This could be a fungal infection. This could be related to whatever reason the ground glass um, nodules are present. Um, and typically, you know, in general, when you have smaller nodules and thyroid cancer, they tend to be in the bases. You can, of course, have thyroid cancer higher up, but, you know, this, this warrants a biopsy rather than assuming it's thyroid cancer. But if it were thyroid cancer, it would be a little bit unusual and it would be radioactive iodine refractory. Sorry. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Stephen, you have comment on this? We don't hear you. I, I don't, sorry. My, my internet connection just became unstable, so. Uh, we Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you, yes. Okay, I'm sorry, my internet connection was unstable during that discussion, so I don't have much to add right now. <laughs> okay, Saleh? Yeah, uh, certainly, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so it's still now a suspense, so we're not sure whether, uh, again, uh, and even from the title of the case, is it, uh, that's the question. But just a, a question to my colleagues at Andy Anderson. I, I now recall in retrospect that the stimulated uh, thyroglobulin earlier on did rise, uh, and I think it was like uh, 0 0.5 and it went up to or six. Five point six. Yeah. Yes. In retrospect, would that uh, have it triggered, you know, uh, kind of like a little bit of more concern at that time initially? I would say, I would say, if I may, that uh, we know from the beginning that the detectable TG reflects some persistent cells. I would not even call it disease. And if you stimulate any persistent cells, you would see an increase in the TG. But I think here is a little bit of, uh, not a little bit, I think there is a major discrepancy between what we see on the CT scan and, uh, and the TG level. Uh, if, this is thyroid can, if this is thyroid cancer metastasis, you would expect uh, much higher thyroglobulin, unless this is poorly differentiated or de-differentiated. Uh, do you agree, Naifa, with that? Yes, yes, I do. Um, that uh, I... So I think, Salah, your question was the TG was out of proportion to any findings in the neck. So that's what made you do the distant imaging. So I just, you know, I think the thyroglobulin initially was like, I think Ali mentioned um, earlier, was that the thyroid, TSH was one or 1 1.2 and the thyroglobulin was 1.2, right? So at that time, you're not sure because the stimulated thyroglobulin went to five, right? In the, in the whole body scan. So now you're seeing the thyroglobin went from 0 0.5 to 6 to 0 0.78 to 1.2. Now it's not suppressed, but close enough, the TSH. So yes, it does make you suspicious, but I think that, you know, like Ali's saying, this is more, if this mass, four centimeters turns out to be a thyroid cancer, this is de-differentiated, right? I think that was the comment you were making, yeah. Sure, let's proceed because we, we, we are running short of time and we still have one case. So let me see what happens. Uh, a month later, uh, December, 2021, we did the PET-CT scan. And that basically again showed that uh, ground glass mass measuring about four centimeter in the left apex. And the SUV of the solid part uh, that measured 1.2 centimeter was only 1.5, no other hypermetabolic areas. So this is the uh, uh, area of interest, uh, very small uh, FDG uptake uh, in that mass. Uh, the question and that, that speaks now against the poorly differentiated or de-differentiated. The, the PET is essentially negative or just mildly positive. 
Let's Generalize proceed. Are we dealing here with thyroid cancer metastasis? Is it uh, coming from the thyroid cancer versus something else? My suspicion was not because the thyroglobin did not trend higher significantly. It didn't trend higher very slightly over time. And if, it, if these chest findings are related to thyroid cancer, then you would expect the thyroglobin to, be, to go much, much higher, uh, at least uh, like uh, above 10, if not even above uh, that. Anyways, I referred her to cardiothoracic surgery. She underwent surgery for diagnostic and therapeutic intent. And indeed, the diagnosis was lung endocarcinoma T2A and zero with negative margins. Uh, and just this month, the thyroid is still ab stable about 1.2 with uh, TSH in target. And this is basically the summary of her TG uh, trend. This is the only one, uh, a higher value that because the thyrogen stimulation uh, otherwise it was below one uh, until uh, March 2019 and then end of 2019 until now slightly above one but being stable. The learning points patients with PTC with indeterminate or biochemically incomplete response to therapy usually harbor a disease that may get detected manifest as recurrence in only 13 to 20% of patients. Active surveillance is the best approach for those patients. Imaging findings that are disproportional and inconsistent with TG trend should raise the concern about another ongoing malignancy. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan. Uh, do you have any final comments on this case before we go to the last case? Dr. Hassan Ferris? Except for uh, we still have definitely biochemical detectability of thyroglobin, so she harbored disease somewhere. Probably it's going to show up at some point in the central compartment uh, by, or in the neck. Uh, that's the most common location for thyroid cancer, but we're doing still active surveillance. Yeah, Naifa, uh, Stephen, Saleh. Great case. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Let's saved his life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so let's go to the last case. Uh, and this time we sh shift gears. This is no more thyroid cancer. It's going to be benign thyroidology. And uh, Salah yeah, is uh, smiling. Happy, yeah? I know. I know you're you're happy. Okay. <laughs> so let's go to uh, to this case. Okay. All right. Um, I have used American Thyroid Association guidelines and I have used European Thyroid Association guidelines. This interesting case, I came across this patient uh, in my last uh, consultant job. Um, she's a 30-year-old female who was seen by the obstructed stream for subfertility, having history of irregular menstruation, and her thyroid functions were requested which showed a TSH of less than 0 0.01, which was undetectable, with a free T4 of 70 picomol per liter. Uh, on that day, her neutrophil counts were 1.43 as opposed to 2, 2 to 4. Uh, interestingly, two months ago, uh, her neutrophil counts were uh, essentially normal. Uh, so, so basically, this is a patient with uh, who was detected to have severe hyperthyroidism with FT4 of 70 and uh, undetectable TSH in the course of investigation for irregular menses. Uh, but in addition to that, she has also neutrophil count that is low. And the question whether this is um, related to, to the hyperthyroidism or not, maybe a short comment from uh, Saleh. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. That, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's uh, not uncommon. And we see this almost all the time. And uh, the, because of the associated uh, granulocytosis and neutropenia with the antithyroid medications, this is always a concern. And with time, we learned that somehow Graves' disease or hyperthyroidism somehow they are actually associated with some bone marrow, maybe suppression, or um, and we see this uh, leukopenia uh, not uncommonly, um, even before even talking about antithyroid uh, medications. Excellent. So let's proceed and see. This patient was referred urgently uh, to the endocrine consultant during COVID pandemic. Um, the advice was given to the general physician to start the patient on cadmium or 20 milligram once daily and to monitor neutrophil counts on a weekly basis and explain the risks and symptoms of agranulocytosis to the patient. She was seen 
uh, and she'll be seen in endocrine clinic in a few weeks. Uh, Propranolol was started uh, to control the symptoms of thyrotoxicosis. Uh, she was a non-smoker in T-total. One more question here. Uh, we're going to challenge you, Dr. Uh, Alim. Uh, who would start this patient with already uh, pre-existing uh, severe, well, relatively severe neutropenia on methimazole? Uh, Saleh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, and again, uh, I would weigh uh, like we always do. So remind me, this is a young uh, patient and no risk of uh, like atrial fibrillation and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it depends on how severe her um, thyrotoxicosis is. In other words, is she going in, is she close to a crisis or a storm? And, and we have started patients with this level of neutrophils uh, on antithyroid medications with close monitoring. Um, so, uh, I mean, if, if the risk and benefits comes to uh, starting us, uh, uh, we, we, the answer, our answer was always yes. And let's monitor closely, maybe even put the patient in the hospital initially. And, and if we need, we could give her uh, EGF or whatever, you know, to to improve her use of it. But it, it depends. I mean, I would if needed. Uh, Stephen Naifa, you have a comment on this? I know you don't deal much with Graves' disease, but uh, we need to remind you of your uh, benign thyroidology. <laughs> Always good to be reminded. It's great. No, Absolutely. I don't have much more to add, except, you know, so... Um, I guess neutropenia occurs maybe what, uh, Salah, about 10% of the time. It's, you know, um, and what the only thing I would add is that I probably would consult hematology, right? Just make sure we're not missing like, missing an underlying disease so that when I, it, it, when I do decide to start, you know, an antithyroid drug that they follow with me and make sure that it's okay. That's the only thing I wanted to add, you know, um, like Salah said, you can do it, but very carefully, but I would get an expert in. I agree. Okay. And, and we almost always get them involved. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, let's see what uh, Dr. Al Alim did. The general physician started carbimazole um, and started monitoring neutrophil counts on a weekly basis. Uh, but then gradually the neutrophil count started to fall um, uh, on weekly blood tests, uh, which resulted in admission to the hospital within three weeks of starting carbimazole with high grade fever, shivering, sweating, and today. I was called in to see the patient in acute medical unit. And when I saw the patient, she was having a mildly enlarged thyroid. She was looking unwell. Uh, she was having a whitish exudate on the left tonsil. Uh, and there was no signs of any thyroiditis. disease. She was initially treated for presine uh, to thepsis by the AMU team with ciprofloxacin and gentamicin. And uh, the blood zone admission confirmed that she's having neutropenic sepsis. Uh, her carbimazole was stopped. Her neutrophil counts got worse to 0.1 and 0.05 the following day. We referred her to maxillofacial surgery team who confirmed the absence of any abscess after doing an X-ray. She was started on filgristin on, on, on the same day. Um, we asked for the hematology input who advised to continue with filgristin um, till the neutrophil counts are more than one for two consecutive days. Since she was on carbimazole for the last three weeks before it was stopped, we repeated her thyroid functions, uh, which was showing that her T4 is getting better to 32 picomol per liter as opposed to 70 picomol per liter, although her TSH was still suppressed. Her thyroid peroxidase antibodies and thyroid receptor antibodies were very strongly positive, uh, which was consistent with her diagnosis of Graves' disease. An ultrasound of the thyroid was arranged, which was in keeping with signs of Graves' disease. So her diagnosis was Graves' disease-induced neutropenia, which, which can happen in one in 10 patients. And then it was complicated by carbimazole-induced agranulocytosis, which can happen in one in a thousand patients. So I think the question here, how can we manage this patient? And this time I want Stephen to uh, remember his benign uh, thyroid dollar. <laughs> well, you know, in this setting, obviously, the, the two options are surgery versus radioactive iodine. Um, and so I think it'd be important to know, obviously, our TRABs are very high. I'd like to know the size of the thyroid. You know, a smaller gland might favor RAI once she recovers from her neutropenia. If it's a big, you know, goiter, I think would tend to favor surgery. Very good. Dr. Alim, uh, you're with us. Uh, can you... Uh... 
answer some of those questions and give us your input at this time. Dr. Alim, we don't hear you. Are you with us? I don't okay. see him on the panel. I don't see him too. Yeah, maybe he was not here. So, okay. So, uh, let, let's see. Uh, maybe we have some answers for uh, those questions in the presentation. So, let's continue. I'll start discussing permanent treatment options with her um, during her hospital stay with us. Uh, I discussed radioidine treatment with her, thyroidectomy with her. Um, while referring her for radioidine, one of the professor of nuclear medicine, he suggested uh, why not propyl thyroxine, but because of 15 to 20 percent um, cross reaction with carbimazole with a risk of agrocytosis, uh, I declined uh, this idea at all and concentrated on radioidine and thyroidectomy. So the patient was counseled for radioidine at a tertiary hospital, uh, but due to COVID-19 pandemic, there were shortages of radioidine um, because of supply chain issues. Uh, secondly, the patient was not keen to travel uh, because of restrictions of pandemic, uh, she was more inclined towards thyroidectomy. I referred her case to a thyroid MDT uh, who discussed her case and came up with a plan of total thyroidectomy with pre-surgery optimization of thyroid hormones. I referred the patient to thyroid surgeon. I started the patient on leucolzyodine, cholestyramine, propranolol, pre-surgery, um, and on the advice of hematologists, we continued with her filgristem, fil um, as, as they suggest to keep the neutrophil counts to more than two uh, during her surgery and pre-surgery. Interestingly, just uh, within 10 to 15 days, uh, her thyroid function stabilized with a T4 nicely coming down to 6.1 picomol per liter. Uh, it, it, it's just interesting. This slide is showing that the thyroid uh, hormone has come down to uh, six uh, spontaneously. They stopped... Uh, Methimazole a couple of weeks ago, and she continued to drop her thyroxine uh, level. And that was interesting because uh, I don't think local solution in the absence of uh, methimazole PTU is beneficial in general. In fact, sometimes it can exacerbate the hyperthyroidism because, as you know, it's uh, the substrate for, um, for thyroid hormone uh, synthesis, the iodine, I mean. So I'm a bit... Uh, unclear about the, the reason for this further decline in the thyroglobulin and the thyroid uh, hormone in the T4. Um, do you agree with me? Do you have any explanation? All right. So uh, let's move. And PSH of less than 0 0.01 and she was ready for her thyroidectomy. She has a successful total thyroidectomy. Uh, she did develop a transient post-operative hypocalcemia. Uh, and interestingly, her neutropenia persisted for six months, though the literature says most of the cases resolved in four to eight weeks. So she did really well uh, after her successful thyroidectomy and she was discharged on thyroxine. The learning points from this case and the difficulties uh, I, I faced and my team faced as a, um, because of this difficult case, it was a unique case of Graves disease induced neutropenia and carbimazole induced agronal cytosis in the same patient. Uh, there should be an early referral to the endocrine team. There should be close monitoring of neutrophils. Um, and we should know that there is alternative medications which can be used to stabilize the right functions in these patients before surgery. And the best practice in the way forward is an MDT approach to these patients. Uh, let me stop here again uh, for any uh, final comments or uh, on this patient before we uh, listen to a little bit of review on this. Saleh, you have any comment on this or Naifa? No, Naifa? no Alim is on. I just wanted to let you know I see him back. I don't know if he can unmute now. Hello. Oh, hi. Uh, do, you, you're saying Dr. Alim is with us? Yes, yes. Yeah, Dr. Alim is with us. Yes, Dr. Alim, can you comment, please? Um, well, it was a unique case, uh, to be honest. I, I just followed the guidelines from the beginning. Uh, neutropenia was 1.43. It wasn't that bad, like the guidelines would say. If it is less than 1.2 or less than 1, then don't start into the right medications. Um, and in my previous experience as well, I've seen quite a few of these patients from time to time. So when we start uh, into the right medications, uh, the neutrophil counts, it goes better with, with, with monitoring. Um, yeah, um, it was an interesting case in a way because it happened just right in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it was difficult to manage her uh, that way as well because uh, 
This case happened uh, on a remote British island. Um, and obviously because of travel restrictions, uh, iodines, uh, radio iodine supply chain issues. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a difficult case at that time, to be honest. Dr. Alim, I want to challenge you a little bit here, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. th this patient had neutropenia before starting uh, methimazole. Uh, she received methimazole. We did not have any scan or uptake to definitely confirm that this is Graves disease. Graves disease, uh, thyroiditis can happen and actually her thyroid function test continue to drop without methimazole. Uh, neutropenia continued for six months. So uh, I'm trying to say uh, here for the sake of discussion that maybe what you dealt with is actually thyroiditis rather than Graves disease and the neutropenia is was an associated condition rather than a complication of the methimazole or Graves disease. What do you say about this? Um, yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, it's, um, uh, if you ask me, uh, probably I would say it was a case of Graves disease because even the ultrasound, the right receptor antibodies, everything proves it. Se secondly, uh, what the learning point was, uh, especially me on the COVID rota, um, I couldn't see this patient. If I would have seen this patient face to face, taken a history myself, then probably that, that would have made life much easier. Um, but I started having was all just on a telephone uh, consultation with a GP. Uh, I couldn't see this patient face to face because being stuck on the COVID wards uh, and then uh, schedule an appointment for her. Yeah, um, so if I would have seen, maybe I would have taken a different decision. But um, lastly, lo looking at um, the overall scenario, looking at the case, I, I think it was a case of Graves disease. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ali, if you allow me, I, I think, uh, yeah, uh, that's a great challenge, uh, Ali, but uh, I think I I, I would uh, agree with Dr. Alim because number one, uh, the uh, the antibodies were, were very positive. Number two, obviously, it looks like, um, uh, you know, uh, ultrasound, uh, I assume there was hypervascularity maybe. But uh, Ali, you and I know that also sometimes that the hypervascularity, when we wrote the, the, the article, sometimes you you will see that in some weird cases of thyroiditis, and especially with COVID, we did have those cases of, you know, uh, uh, associated thyroid disorders with COVID and whatnot. So who knows? I, I agree. But I think um, uh, uh, why the thyroid functions improved uh, so much, um, and, and I'm not sure about the timeline of starting the Lugol and the cholestyramine um, and the propranolol, you know, uh, the, the, the propranolol is mostly the peripheral conversion. Uh, the, now the Lugol, and I agree with you, Ali, that without the protection of uh, antithyroids, there is the risk of this, this now, you know, um, uh, but, but it works. I mean, it, it, it does work in high dose. Uh, Lugol, uh, and it, it prepares the thyroid gland for surgery. Uh, and we do see sometimes so-called auto, like auto improvement of uh, hyperthyroidism in a grave disease, you know, the, um, the thyroid burning itself and whatnot. Now, honestly, I, I, I do believe similar to uh, Dr. Alima knew that this patient has Graves disease and the neutropenia was exacerbated by methimazole. I just raised the question to uh, to uh, always keep uh, an open eyes, uh, open eyes on on other possibilities, but I think all all in all, this case is most likely uh, a Graves disease exacerbated uh, with neutropenia exacerbated by the methimazole. Uh, we are actually coming to an end. Uh, I know the Alim has a few slides uh, as a few, but uh, maybe we can listen to them quickly and uh, close the se session. Uh, so let's just listen to the last few slides. Now, just a little bit about uh, sorry, Graves disease-induced neutropenia. Uh, it happens in approxim approximately one in 10 cases. Uh, neutropenia usually appears as a mild to moderate laboratory abnormality, uh, and it, it, it resolved uh, as you treat hyperthyroidism. Um, according to American Thyroid Association guidelines, uh, it can vary from mild to moderate neutropenia, which occur in about 10% of patients with Graves' disease. Uh, but severe neutropenia because of Graves' disease, it's extremely rare, and careful consideration should be given to start antithyroid medications in patients with severe neutropenia, and they should be investigated for other causes of neutropenia. Now, coming to the side effects of antithyroid medications, dark urine, arthralgia, abdominal subsequent visit about these life-threatening 
uh, side effects. Uh, as per ATA guidelines, uh, recommendation 15 says that we should check full blood count and LFTs at baseline before starting antithyroid medications. Going through egg granulocytosis, uh, it can happen uh, in one in a thousand patients approximately. PTU at any dose appears to be more likely to cause egg granulocytosis compared with low doses of carbimazole. Uh, and a retrospective study from Japan uh, has shown that they, they studied 50,000 patients of Graves' disease in which 55 developed egg granulocytosis with a median interval of onset of 69 days. And most cases occur in the first 90 days. Mortality rates is around 21% uh, of agrocytosis. Patients usually present with fever, sore throat, painful mouth ulcers, and anal ulcers. There's reduced immune response, and these patients are prone to bacterial infections. Uh, main signs are ulcerate to necrotic changes in the mucous membranes of respiratory and gastrointestinal tract. Actually, the organizers are uh, asking me to conclude the session. I think we have already uh, got all the educational points of this case and the previous cases. At the end of this session, I would like to thank our uh, uh, expert panel. I really enjoyed the comments and the cases. I would like also to thank the presenters who uh, really um, uh, put time and effort to uh, bring uh, very fascinating cases. And thank you so much for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Take care for now. See you soon.